Good morning, everyone. So I'm really pleased to be here to uh, have a conversation. We actually had this interview last night in the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Talked for about an hour on a wide range of topics and uh, had a lot in common. So excited to uh, kind of bring some light to the evolution of tokenization and how it's affected Mark's business. Um, we, I think we should introduce ourselves just very briefly. Um, Bread Wallet, now called BRD, is one of the safest and most secure mobile wallets for holding cryptocurrency and now trading cryptocurrency. And we're really excited to have partnered with Token Market to bring a smoother, safer, and more efficient method of buying into ICOs, token sales, via the BRD app. So be looking for that in the coming months. And um, please feel free to, to find me after the chat or later today if you want to learn more about that. So, and I'll have Mark introduce Seed. Yeah, well, thanks, Ada. Um, Seed is a distributed marketplace for the buyers and sellers of bots and the components that make up bots. So we're really trying to figure out how do we best democratize artificial intelligence. Um, in terms of my background, it was uh, Bay Area, uh, 1990s, helping to build the third dot-com website. Ended up having a VR company, worked at Xerox Park, Stanford Research Institute. Did a lot of work in artificial intelligence, trying to figure out how do we make little 3D characters talk. Um, and so it was uh, 2011, um, my third startup, second in artificial intelligence, um, that I came across Bitcoin. Um, and that was an interesting moment because I think, you know, we all have, I think you mentioned it was the, it was the BCC. Yeah, I, I, said, I asked Mark to introduce himself by talking about his life, BBC, B before blockchain. Um, you know, what were you doing when kind of the inspiration hit or you started to become aware of this different avenue of technology? Yeah. I mean, because we all had that moment, right? It was like, wait, there's something here. So Bitcoin was like seven cents or 11 cents. And I, I, I noticed that, well, there's a limited number of them, which was a new idea. Like, this government can't print money. And so there seemed to be something, we call it trustless now. Um, so the Ethereum ICO came along, and, um, and at the time I had started a company named Botanic, and we were building these multimodal bots. So on Skype, just as you can talk to a person, you can also speak with an artificially intelligent character, a little cartoon character. And so gradually we grew the company thanks to, you know, Ethereum and Bitcoin. And then Outlier Ventures was like, have you thought about tokenizing this? And that was years before we actually realized that there was a real need. Um, that was years ago we had realized that there was a real need um, looking at what was happening with Facebook and Amazon and others. And what was your moment before? What was your BBC? My BBC life, yes. Yeah. So um, I actually launched, I was in financial services and I launched a prepaid debit card for families in the US. And so there was a point where I realized that I could only support US customers, but I had a global business kind of by accident. And so I started looking for ways for um, parents to interact with kids without fiat. And that's when I discovered cryptocurrencies. And um, so my I knew about Bitcoin, but I wasn't thinking about Bitcoin. I was thinking about alternative crypto at the time. And I started investigating and um, for a lot of the reasons that Jonathan mentioned in his talk yesterday, just kind of a negative PR halo that was, you know, part of the cryptocurrency ecosystem, I decided crypto and teaching kids about money was going to be a very steep uphill climb. And so I didn't go that route. But that was when kind of the door opened for me in learning about crypto um, was just, hey, what if it wasn't government issued money? What if I issued the money? What if you know, it was something totally different. So, yeah, I mean, that was definitely life-changing, um, and I and I think it has been industry-changing, too, for financial services since then. So I've been a big part of that, and certainly with continuing with BRD. So why, to why tokenize the... So you're talking about tokenizing the service or the information that's passed from someone who provides the information to someone who consumes the information in, like, a, an AI environment. Mm -hmm. Why tokenize it? Well, part of it has to do with the fact that <clears throat> artificial intelligence, if we can consider AI as basically just big data, it's like huge libraries that are there. And we've all been contributing this data voluntarily. How many people have a Facebook account? Okay, and keep your hand up, please. How many of you have a Google account? Right, so each hand represents <laughs> about 75 bucks a month. 
It, now, that's an average spread. In some cases, it's fractions of a penny per account. But really, that's, that's money that you guys should be getting. Mark Zuckerberg pockets that and goes home to buy fancy houses. That doesn't really make sense to me. Living in San Francisco, I see this massive economic displacement that's occurring. And whether it's Google or Facebook or other companies that aren't recognizing the end user values, that data goes into driving what are now the largest, most powerful AI systems on the planet. Facebook and Google have in that, like, unequivocally the, the, the most powerful prediction models out there because of our data. So if AI is built on our data and we're contributing that value, I think it's only fair that, that we be compensated for that. <clears throat> so this is part of the issue. Now, artificial intelligence is really just an ability to predict based on past events. And the distributed ledger is really just like a shared view of what the transactions over the past have been. And those two things match really well when you think about it. So if you contribute some knowledge, such as, you know, how to start an ICO, or how to launch an app, or how to unbruise an avocado, or whatever knowledge it might be, when somebody else uses that knowledge, the bot's able to identify who is the provider and who is the consumer. And so we have, there's, there's these two things these two different things, which is there's, there's distribution and then there's decentralization. And tokens offer this incredible decentralization, but the distribution has traditionally been bottlenecked. I had to go buy Bitcoin with dollars. It was like seven steps to get there. But even today, if I go to buy a token, I have to use some other currency for that. And we're like, no, 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 let's not do that. This has got to be an open system where anybody can go and by talking with one of these characters, Think of it like Wikipedia, okay? The Wikipedia is a knowledge base. So anytime somebody can contribute to that, as soon as what they've contributed is used, then they receive seed. Rather than saying, okay, I've got X amount of fiat or X amount of crypto, and I'm going to buy seed. You can buy seed, of course, right? But we can also earn seed as individuals so that some kid that's in Mexico, that's the avocado farmer's son, can say, here's how you take care of avocados. And when somebody else uses that knowledge via this marketplace of bots, then that kid can get some seed token for it. So we're looking at decentralization and distribution as, as ways of improving not only tokens and cryptocurrencies in general, but knowledge markets and much larger the democratization of AI. How do you envision the pricing in a decentralized marketplace for knowledge? You know, we really don't know because I think that some sets of knowledge will be more valuable than others. And so in this bot store, we have not deployed this. This is going to be through next year. But there'll be this bot store and there'll be five stars that will be possible for each bot. And those component parts will also have five stars based on whether or not somebody's used that information. And I think some information that's extremely in demand and also by you know, some definition rare, will be at a higher value. But ultimately, it's going to be the market that will decide that. So we're going to let this float. We That's what I was wondering. Yeah, will it be like the users decide the quality, the users decide the price? Totally. Mm -hmm. It's got to be that's that. That's interesting. And the bot, I mean, what's a bad bot? We've said, well, you know, if we have a bot that's there to talk about, it's giving you photographs of bicycles, for example, and it says in the licensing term that that's what it does, then that's fine. If you have a bot that gives you photos of porn, and it says in the licensing term, that's fine. But if you it have might a be the porn, best use case. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. It's gonna Everything happen, gets right? started in porn. I absolutely. Know, know. Absolutely. But yeah. if the bot says, I'm going to give you photos of porn, and it gives you photos of bicycle, <laughs> it's not a good Unless bot. That's it's a bad thing. bot. Unless right? that's your thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really, it's really like, and it's very much about, we have these rules in place, but in terms of developing the community, 10,000 developers have signed up. We have a strong partnership program that's going, thanks to Thomas Schultz. And um, we have multiple millions of bot developers now that are gathering around. And, and it's exciting, because 17 years of building chat bots, now we're building video bots. And these bots will also be running in augmented reality and virtual reality. So it's really exciting to see that we can, we can democratize artificial intelligence, because if we don't, then we're going to end up with our personal decisions of our health and our finances and our children's education being determined by corporate systems such as Facebook that may or may not take our personal values at heart. And so we need to make sure that artificial intelligence is open source so that it's visible, so that it's something that we all can control and that we all can access and benefit from. Yeah, know? it's very democratic. I almost hate calling it artificial intelligence because it's 
it's actually real intelligence. I mean, it's real people, real, you know, real, real ideas. Data, yeah. And so, yeah, real information. Um, so as you are, you know, your business has taken a turn in the last, what, year or two that, mm. that this has really, I mean, how has it changed your view of what can be done and, and what's possible? Is, yeah. is, it, is it a huge expansion of possibility? Well, Botanic, you know, I founded Botanic in 2011, and we, you know, we had Microsoft, Logitech, BMW, other customers. We continued to do that work. And now Botanic is a partner in Seed. And um, as one of the trustees, Nathan Shedroff is the CEO of Seed, and I'm really happy to watch Seed eclipsing my own company, Botanic, as just a partner. And so what it's, it feels really a lot, Ada, to me like 1998 or 99, when suddenly we saw the web growing, and it's the same level of fanaticism of like, wow, we can actually take back control of our lives. Now with the web, we, we kind of messed it up, right? <laughs> so we need to not do that again with bots. The, the hype around bots, we went through this Gartner curve and we're in the slump now, but conversational interfaces and talking with machines is going to be happening. Whether it's our cars, whether it's our refrigerators, whether it's systems on the phone that are helping us with healthcare, we need to really recognize that we can have an impact on the future. And now with the learnings of the web and social media, I'm really excited about it because the problem with Wikipedia isn't that it doesn't work, is that there isn't a monetization model to really provide data curation within it. And by the way, you know, Wikipedia is based on RDF, so we can use that in things like IBM Watson or ChatScript or AML or the other natural language processing systems we use. What do you see as kind of the, the first and best frontier for the technology that you're talking about? I mean, it's so broad, right? I mean, it could be, you could be learning, like you said, about avocado, you know, unbruising an avocado, or you could be fixing um, a combine on a farm, I mean, like, and everything in between. So what do you see as, like, the first use case, the practical, when is somebody going to be like, this is awesome, like, I needed this, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, healthcare, interestingly. Um, and I don't think this is just because Botanic is an American corporation. Um, you know, I, I'd be yeah. interested to do... Because our healthcare is more broken than most people's. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. Yeah. So, cool. every, every system has its problems, of course. But, sorry, Some go ahead, healthcare. More. Yeah, I mean, the, the ability to talk with a bot or an avatar and say, you know, I'm having problems with my asthma, what's the air quality index, is some of the stuff we talked about last night. You know, getting information that's outside of your immediate sphere of reference is what these things are very good for, helping predict the ways in which your health can be improved. Of course, that's very private data, therefore it's very valuable data. The more private, the more valuable usually. Which means that there's also an opportunity for abuse of that data. Um, I'd be interested to look at Wikipedia and see like, where is the sentence that's been read the most of all of Wikipedia, all that knowledge base, or what are the, the pages or categories that have been used the most? And I would imagine we get some useful uh, kind of guiding posts there. But in terms of the last 11 years, it's been primarily healthcare, financial, mobility, um, there's been a lot of entertainment. We've had a fun time building for some games, conversational mm -hmm. avatars there. Um, and I think that you know one of the key problems is that as a little company with just 21 people, we had as many customers that were at the door last year, and it was like, we need to open source this. Just it's too, the opportunities are too large. And so we really look forward to trying to build you know, as we bring developers in, then we also are bringing in some partners and some customers and really looking at ways that this becomes a holistic infrastructure. So the short answer is it's an opportunity to really do some big good, you know? For sure. So um, I'd like to wrap up with like a more visionary question. So obviously there are a lot of directions that businesses can go and certainly token sales can go and, um, and the blockchain has, has changed things for all of us. Um, if, if things are a wild success, if you achieve what you want to achieve in terms of the, the tokenization of information, the friendlier chatbots, all of these things, I mean, where will that put you? What do you see as the big change, you know, two years, five years from now? What do you, what do you envision? Well, first let me, let me set the stage for what could happen if we don't do this, which is that we have increasingly proprietary models like Amazon Echo or the Alexa that's constantly listening to us and we don't know who's taking that data nor do we know who's providing the data. So if I say to Alexa, what do I do with my asthma? Somebody that provided that Alexa skill, whom I have no idea who it is, is coaching me. 
The other thing happens, I think, if we don't do this, is that we will be surrounded by swarms of gibbering advertisements that will constantly be attacking us from our phones and from devices that are talking, and will constantly be surrounded by things that are just blasting us with advertising, because that's been the financial model of the last couple decades. And then there's this question of quality, not just of the information being useful, but just of the basics of the design and, and how we the interact with that stuff, yeah. the experience yeah. of it, right? Yeah, that experience can kill the I whole mean, thing, right? This is a nightmare, and we've all seen a little bit of the uncanny valley. We've all talked to bots that really suck, and so what we want to do is to try to avoid that. Now, five or ten years down the road, one of the things that I think would be excellent to achieve is silence in which we don't just have our phones constantly attacking us, and we don't have information constantly trying to get our attention. But in fact, there are systems there that take our values as end users. Sometimes it might be the need for reflection or the need for time with your family, and knows you well enough to know when that needs to be happening. We do a lot of measurement of affect sentiment detection, where we can take, you know, there's CV models that basically, you know, if I say, I love public speaking. That's how they're doing that. I'm like, I love public speaking. And so we can, we can build affect models where these systems can actually detect how you feel at that time. So five or 10 years from now, that's going to be commonplace. I can tell you that Amazon is focused on one key set of data, and that's affect. They want to know why you're buying something. So Alexa is going to be very good at determining your emotions. If it's, well, it's already fairly good at it, but we just don't know it. So these systems will understand our emotions, they'll understand ways to interact with us, and they'll give us the room to be who we most want to be, rather than subconsciously guiding us to make purchasing decisions or to go to places, you know, because as humans, we're actually quite easy to predict and very easy to measure, and we need to make sure that's not happening. Surveillance state's already big enough. Let's not make it worse. <laughs> So, yeah, I think that the, so it's a wide frontier, um, but I'm very excited to see how things develop um, with Seed, and we'll certainly stay in touch. What's the, what kinds of people are you looking to get in touch with post-conference once you, you run out the door to the airport? Yeah, I mean, um, we went through a first round of private pre-sales, and so we'll be opening the doors for that again in a couple weeks, um, and then... In the meanwhile, what we really need are folks that are there to help us with the developer crowd that we've got. I mean, we have thousands of people that want to help out, and we only have about like 60 people total working on Seed right now, kind of like you know, either full or half time. So we need some developers that are there that really understand uh, bots, natural language processing, uh, API service calls that can help us with the community management. Um, and then also, we're really actively building our partners um, who are these companies like, you know, they're doing the deep end AI work. We provide an interface to that. So you know, Ben Gertzel of SingularityNet, I've worked with him for a number of years, and it's like this stuff fits really well together with SingularityNet and other similar projects. So we can provide, um, you know, the Trent McConaughey of Ocean Protocol is one of our advisors. Um, Michael Talve, Microsoft's chief AI architect. Right? So these are folks that, that we are working with so that we can provide that front-end layer, and they really understand AI, and they can help us develop those communities more. Um, and the best way to get in touch with you or connect with Seed, seed on the screen? Seedtoken.io. Uh, seed right. Please jot it down. Send me an email. I'm mark at seedtoken.io, and um, just remind me that I was blabbing on the stage, and I'd be happy to help <laughs> out as I could. Well, this was great. I hope everyone got a good window into some of the exciting developments at yeah. Seed. And um, as I said, I'm happy to talk with any of you um, throughout the conference. I'll be here all day. Yeah. And lastly, just to excuse me to wrap up, uh, Ryan, Ramsu, everyone at Token Market, thank you for having us. It's really, it's great to be here. Yeah, it's been great. Thanks so much.